I'd like to hear everybody's thoughts on what do you know about the Irish potato famine? Well, I, oh, <laughs> my understanding was that um, I don't know how true or false it is, you know, where you get information, but I have visions of um, us shipping potatoes out of Ireland and selling them while the famine was going on, even though it's caused, like, was it caused by uh, potato blight? That's about it. And it might be completely wrong. <laughs> it's connected to the Corn Laws. You are, yes. Law, yes. back to that. Yeah, back um, when back to that. Yeah, 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 back to that. These were some of those patches of a period of really bad summers. Um, and right, the potato blight was in Ireland, but it was also in other places too. So there was a, they were important exporting potatoes <laughs> because they were all rotten. Um, and the people of Ireland, they, there were some other crops growing. So they, well, there's some. Rain and that, and I think it wasn't what the Irish, poor Irish, who were their own potatoes, could afford to buy. Um, it was also a sign of the corn laws, which meant that you couldn't import corn from America, which is where it came from, from Canada, um, because the landlords um, who owned the big um, arable farms. Um, growing corn and whatever, um, wanted a good price for their crops. So, yeah, the American stuff that undercut it. So, there wasn't, they couldn't, so the poor people couldn't buy bread or anything like that. In fact, as they were largely peasants, they were growing to see themselves. They didn't have much in the way of money. Um, and there wasn't a lot of I mean, rhetoric got the wheat, and there was poverty not only in Ireland, but there was a famine uh, because of it being a one crop um, culture. You know, they all fed potatoes, that was it, really. Mm-hmm. Maybe there was a few greens, and um, maybe some rhubarb. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that um, they weren't in a position to buy wheat or corn or flour or anything. And also, it become very expensive because the land you're so also a bad harvest. Uh, so, uh, I think that I'm mean, what it was, but other parts of Europe also sort of uh, went through a very shortage too. Nothing like that. I don't mm-hmm. think most people are dependent on potatoes from entirely for their diets. Mm-hmm. Right. 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 That's enough. That's, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'm going to keep something away, right? Part of why I want to do this talk tonight is to, to get your help in thinking through a course, an online course that I'm doing. I'm putting together, I, I was asked three years ago, oh, time flies, um, <laughs> to, to Put something together for uh, a, a gent um, who teaches criminology. Now, his students, uh, Phil's students, uh, were really interested in uh, food injustice. That, that got them going. He said, I, I did a series of articles on manipulation of staple food prices by the stock market. And over the years, I researched more and more, uh, and I finally sort of gone, oh yeah, I promised, okay? I promised Phil I'd do this. So I'm going to be putting together a course online, and uh, it will be on the Cooks platform, Community Open Online Courses. And uh, I decided to... Um, 
to use a, a particular book which um, to, to help structure it. Um, Jean Zeigler, who on this is called Betting on Famine, Why the World Still Goes Hungry. So thinking, listening through my talk tonight, I'd like you to keep in the back of your mind, what would you like to know? What, what do you think should be on a course about the, the right to food and the topics that we're covering tonight? Um, so with, with that, and it, it's good to uh, be able to, to draw on the wisdom of crowds and pick up a lot of things that I want. Um, could we get the next slide, please? Um, so, as was touched upon, it was an artificially created famine. Uh, the, the Irish potato famine took place between 1845 and 1849 and is associated with mass starvation, disease and emigration. The most severely affected were in the west and south of Ireland. The worst year of the time was known as Black 47. During the famine, about one million people died and one million people emigrated from Ireland, resulting in a drop in the population by one-fifth to one-quarter. That is one in five or one in four people. The cause of the famine is commonly reported as a natural event. Potato blight had infected potato crops throughout Europe during the 1840s, bringing about some 100,000 deaths. So that's, that's a, an interesting comparator. Across Europe, there were 100,000 deaths because the, 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 there was poor weather, there were poor harvests on the go. But in Ireland, there was one million deaths. So the, there's a, a magnitude of something happening in that, that geography. So I, I was scouting around for sources and uh, interestingly I came across uh, a, a report published by the New Jersey Commission on Holocaust Education uh, and it was published in 1996 uh, for inclusion in the Holocaust and Genocide Curriculum at secondary level uh, in New Jersey. Um, but this, this is taken from it. Between 1845 and 1850, more than a million Irish people starved to death, while massive quantities of food were being exported from their country. Uh, a half million were evicted from their homes during the pota potato blight, and a million and a half had emigrated to America, Britain and Australia, often on board rotting over crowded, what we call coffin ships. Now, the potato blight had affected potatoes as a crop. Uh, uh, I believe it was a fungus, and you couldn't even eat the rotten uh, tumour. Um, so, the, the potato crops were wrecked. Uh, but I think the, the, the rest of the facts start to build a picture around this that, that has been picked up by um, uh, professors of international law. Um, so Dr. Christine Keneally, a, a fellow at the University of Liverpool and author of two scholarly texts on the Irish famine, The Great Calamity and a Death-Dealing Famine, says that 9,902 calves were exported from Ireland to England during Black 47, and that was an increase of 33% from the previous year. In the 12 months following the second failure of the potato crop, 4,000 horses and ponies were exported. The export of livestock to Britain, with the exception of pigs, increased during the famine. The export of bacon and ham increased. In total, over 3 million live animals were exported from Ireland between 1846 to 1850. 
That was more than a, more than the number of people who emigrated during the famine years. So I, I tuned into the, the work of Professor of International Law, Francis Anthony Boyle, who wrote uh, United Ireland, Human Rights and International Law. And then it, he concludes that the British government deliberately pursued a race an ethnically based policy <clears throat> aimed at destroying the group commonly known as the Irish people. And the, the policy of mass starvation amounted to genocide per the Hague Convention of 1948. Uh, and I will, I will be writing all of this up and putting it on the website so you can uh, tap into these resources. Um, so, so, can I get your thoughts on the potato, the Irish potato famine now? Is, are there new thoughts? What, how, how, how is that introduction? Uh, has it changed the way you're uh, looking at the historical event? Is, is there something lacking from it? Uh, there was mention of the Corn Laws, and the Corn Laws were a very interesting time uh, where Robert Peel, I think, was um, trying to repeal the, the Corn Laws. Now, there was an earlier famine in, in Ireland, and the, the, the government at the time said, you're not allowed to export food whilst people are dying. But in what we know now is the, the Great Irish Potato Famine, no such governmental intervention came. And this is bound up with the Corn Laws. And that, that is a whole different talk for a different day. But something that I'm very passionate about, because again, so it's about setting the price of staple foods and that determines who can eat and who can't which is the central theme of the night um so from that beginning is there anything that you, you... Uh, i mean i don't know that much about history because i'm not british uh, but um i mean i'm i'm aware that we have uh, Irish ministers who are um, more or less not qualified, really, or it comes out that their knowledge about the Irish issue is uh, very small. No. Um, did they have at the time uh, an Irish minister, or was there anybody in the government who who was? It was a very conflicted time uh, in Ireland, and I'm, I'm still honestly trying to get to grips with a very complex and traumatic history. Uh, if, you, if you look over what, what the, the Irish population had to suffer, for example, have you heard of the hedge schools? Yeah. So the, the, the hedge school, fantastic, yes. Uh, it is a wonderful, wonderful tradition of education that was free. And it, it, it dated back to the bardic traditions. And education was banned on pain of death by the British government. If you recall, nurturing people and fostering development, you know, uh, at the same period, it was the, the same period, I believe. Yeah, right. Well, it's colonisation, so yes. Uh, so, so the Catholic, the the the, the 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 schisms of the Catholic and Protestant worlds that we're working on. You've got uh, you know, uh, the, all, all the sort of Cromwellian history, the the colonisation, the, the absolute. Suppression, oppression, traumatization, and genocide, uh, uh, according to, you know, lots of people now of, of these populations. And 
the way they got around that with, with education was they would meet beside hedges. And when booted fruit came along, they went, what are y'all doing here? Oh, well, we're just looking at the sky and the rain coming over the mountains. And, you know, just, why? why? Why do you ask? And I wonder whether the famous multi-leveled wit of the Irish <laughs> came from this being able to say multiple things in a single space. <laughs> uh, uh, Sigmund Freud said, the ordinary people are totally impervious to psychoanalysis by the Irish. <laughs> uh, so, it, um, the, the, this gives us a flavour. And it, for me, knowing about some of this discourse, makes me aware of what human beings are capable of. And I want, I want to emphasize it. The more I, I investigate this, this is, this is a homo sapiens problem. It's not a culture. It's not a particular time. It seems to, this, this kind of behavior, when people are definitely needing just a bowl of food. But these are bad decisions, aren't they? Yeah. Are they deliberate bad decisions or are they accidental? Well, this is what we're covering. In, in the potato famine, these were deliberate. Because mm. it's interesting because you think about Brexit at the moment. Do you think that's also, that's a whole set of bad decisions. And so there, was a, there was a minister, I think, who said this morning, you know, and Theresa May made, made, a, made a, an art of bad judgment. This, this isn't just the difference between telling people mistaking a Rubens from a Van Gogh. This was a whole tape one, as he put it. <laughs> <laughs> which, which is a bit rude, but... <laughs> a, a broken country gets sold cheap. Mm. You know, and... Uh, if, if bus drivers or bakers made this consistent error of judgment, they would not be allowed to drive a bus or bake goods for us. So, you know. <laughs> um, so I, I think that, that in a world of seven billion people, there's a there's always the all of the above. There's a mixture of bad decisions, and there's a th there are malevolent types. There are people, unfortunately, who will do nasty things because it makes them more money. But then there's a lot of people who would not dream of doing that. And I like, you know, this journey for me is a sense-making process. I'm trying to make sense of a really crazy world because this scares the living daylights out of me. But then when I look at the optimistic stories, the positive stories, the constructive, I'm not so scared anymore. I'm just weary. I'm just sort of going, I want to become more aware. So with that, I yes. Just a, a question on the theme of optimism. Uh, so w were there any kind of, was there a, a popular backlash against the kind of misery and the death Kind of the politically motivated death of the Irish people from Britain was the <laughs> uh, kickback. Uh, I, I think you could have a chat with any given Irish person and very quickly understand. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they've been absolutely hammered and unfairly so. E e sorry. I was going to say, if you colonise, you, there's an assumption of power, isn't there? Mm -hmm. And, you know, really, you, they were an oppressed people. Yeah, but so, from, from Britain, you know, so, just, I, I assume that this will have hit the media in some way, shape or form. So was the, you know, from the people, the Brit British people, was there a kind of resistance? Was there a kind of any kind of popular pressure placed on the government to kind of cease these activities of murder? Uh, I would have to look into that, but there's a very interesting area 
the power and the production of history. Like, the, 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 there's a really great thesis on who gets to tell the tale. And one of the case studies is Alamo. One of the case studies is the island of Haiti. So, the island of Haiti, the <laughs> French, French government sort of went, nobody's got back in touch. Oh, well, there can't be a revolt. Because the, the people are capable of revolting. Send some more people. <laughs> they sent more people. Oh, well, they've not gone in touch. Well, where have they gone? Well, we don't know. Where's that battalion? We sent a battalion. Well, we can't have revolted. And the, the, the study of history in, in this book is uh, about the utter disbelief, the, the non-engagement. It's as, it sits as a silence. Wherever you create a fact, you also create silence, is the thesis. And when you create the, the fact that the, the French colonial forces were un, you know, perfect in, in their operating, as, as with the story of the 42nd Legion, the Roman Legion, went north of uh, Hadrian's Wall, and uh, the Romans just went with savages up there. Right, send up some people, they disappeared. Send up more people, they disappeared. Send up all the battalion, battalion disappeared. Just build a wall. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going up there, savages over there. Um, so that, that's how, without knowing facts, I, I'd, uh, but it's a, it's a journey. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, yes, this, Wonderful, wonderful book um, by Professor Jean Zeigler is um, written after he had finished uh, his office as the special rapporteur for the United Nations on the right to food. Now, he was the first in this position, and he operated in that position for eight years, and he went all over the world trying to get a sense of uh, uh, what is involved in the, the right to food. Um, after he uh, finished in that post, he published this book as, uh, as a vindication of all the people he had worked with. And I, I think this is... Uh, one of the most affecting books that I've, I've come across. So I, I'm keen to get your help in how to rationalize the information I've found out with a particular work focus on the work of the United Nations rapporteur. Uh, this talk is largely structured around his, his and his colleagues published research, chiefly his book, Betting on Famine, Why the World Still Goes Hungry. So, um, uh, why are, I, I, I started looking at the district of, uh, the financial district of London. Has anybody been there on the weekend? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like an apocalyptic mm -hmm. film. <laughs> well. Uh, it's, a, it's a, the square miles, the financial mm -hmm. district of London. And walking through that uh, weekend, it's just, uh, when I did it, it was just empty. Mm. And I was like... You mean you sit on it? The city. It's the whole thing. It's devoid of real life. Mm. These are just glass and steel buildings filled with people who come in and sort of go right plug in. And here's lots of numbers. Here's, you know, buy, sell. <laughs> sell it's buy. amazing during the week, though. <laughs> yeah? It's it really it's amazing. It's, it's, it's a fascinating place. Uh, and what's, I think, important to, to parse is this is where decisions get made on people's lives across the globe. So, so the farmer standing on the ground looking at the horizon, 
is not making the decision about what's happening in that land with the produce, with the community, with the individual, with the families, with the biodiversity, with the, so the care of the soil that we've got to protect, otherwise it erodes and disappears and we can't grow anything. <laughs> it's made in these glass and steel towers and the stock market uh, is a series of numbers, not, not conscious numbers, <laughs> that are making these decisions. We, we, we're, we're playing craps with the world. So our, our current accounts, the domestic and investment banking are two very different beasts. Mm -hmm. uh, and the aggregation of these is <laughs> uh, disastrous. You know, part of part of a series of disasters, um, and the effect of the stock market. Um, and this is, like I say, uh, Gene Zeidler's work. Um, expropriation of the land by biofuel corporations. So think huge numbers of people just being told, "Oh, you get off it." Um, we're going to be growing sugarcane. Where will we go? Well, we don't care, just not here. We're growing sugarcane for biofuel. Biofuel that will be, that's traded by multinationals, uh, as green gold. Um, speculation on, on staple foods on commodities exchanges. So, it, it's not, like uh, added value foods for popping into Marks and Spencer's, you know, uh, your chicken dinner. It's a bowl of millet or uh, corn that will keep people going for another 24 hours. Global power of the multinational corporations that dominate the agri food industry. So uh, there, there's an interesting thesis uh, from. Uh, EHT Zurich, which analyzes the connections of multinationals and uh, they established that after 1999 and the merge, the lifting of the amount of uh, holdings that investment banks could have. So up to a certain point, investment banks could only buy so much of a, a given market. And that, that was sort of a monopoly, a prevention of monopoly. In 1999, that lift, that ceiling was lifted up. Suddenly, they could buy up all the coal in the world if they had the money. So, uh, the, the thesis EHB Zurich shows that, that it was a, an emergence of a, what they call an economic super entity. You've heard too big to fail. Okay. Too big, you know, it's too big to get it right, you know. Any number of, uh, anyway, hedge funds that speculate on the prices of agricultural commodities is superior to the power of national governments and all of them intergovernmental organizations. So we're getting companies like Monsanto suing governments for going, you can't poison our bee populations with neonicotinoids. Uh, oh, well, we've lost profit because of that. So we're going to extract that profit from your cultures. Um, the leaders of agri food and finance companies decide every day who on this planet will live and who will die. And my disclosure is that, uh, Zygo has shifted my perspective from one that's passive to one that's active. I'm now starting to see this in terms of lives lost, uh, biodiversity lost, uh, Amazon lost, than pounds, dollars made. So these are more bad decisions. Yes. But not very, very narrow decisions. Very narrow decisions. Uh, these are, these are, I, at one point, I was training to, to invest in the stock market. I thought, oh, 
I'll make it a living. I know, <laughs> changing places, like, since the it's it's smart, did it? Why not? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, I was, I, I did the, the projections, and they were all just on a piece of paper. I was just looking at numbers going up and down. Well, that, that goes up. My, my cell signal comes up. I got, yeah, I was using imaginary money. And you can do it with financial broadsheets. And a friend said, I'll get you a job in the city, no problem. Any monkey could do it, you know, as long as you like Gaelic's. Uh, and I thought, hey, I'll make a living. I can play with numbers and then go out and meet my friends. And then at the end of it, <laughs> she, she said, Okay, well, you can do value investing, no problem. Do you know how you're making your money? Oh, come on, what, Jess? And she made me think about the ethics. Because it's one play, one thing doing a, a, a numbers game, and it's a totally other thing going, oh, right, okay, I've just, I've just made a, a killing off of a killing in the Congo. For tenth month or whatever, I just displaced. I, I made my 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 income from uh, starving some people. And I just went, oh rubbish! <laughs> oh no, that seems so simple. But a lot of people work in the stock market. They they've not thought about it. That's that's how they get their nest egg, and they say. Oh, when I've got the money, then I'll sit down and I'll do something nice in the community. I'll make up my karma. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and one friend said, well, nose to the drop. Um, so, so some, some facts about starvation in the world population. Among all human rights, the right to, the right to food is the most constantly violated on our planet. In 2016, the number of chronically undernourished people in the world is estimated to have increased to 815 million, up from 770 million in 2015, although still down from about 900 million in 2000, nearly a billion human beings out of the 7 billion on the planet thus suffer from permanent hunger. Now, a bit about the, the way the UN are understanding hunger is the, uh, they look at caloric intake. How many calories are you taking in a day? And self-admittedly, they're not looking at the quality of the food. So, say, for example, I am living out of Poundland because everything's so nice and cheap and sweet, packed full of glucose. Mm. Um, I'm getting lots of glucose, but I'm lacking the rest of the vitamins that I might get from nice uh, uh, vegetables and fruit that are grown out, you know, in the peaks. Qualitatively, these measures are not looked at. These are about calories. Uh, next slide, please. So, the bottom line that Mr. Zeigler says is the agricultural, global agricultural system is capable of feeding 12 billion people. And this is his quote. The destruction every year of tens of millions of men, women, and children from hunger is the greatest scandal of our era. Every five seconds, a child under the age of ten dies of hunger. On a planet abounding in wealth and rich uh, in natural resources, in its current state, the global agricultural system would, in fact, without any difficulty, be capable of feeding 12 billion people or twice the world's current population. Hunger is thus in no way inevitable. Every child who starves to death is murdered. And th this is, this is how, what's, what's affecting me. I'm, I'm questioning the rhetorics 
of we need to be more productive uh, because we can't feed the rest. And I'm starting to look at where scarcity is manufactured. Because if I if I got all the resources, I can ask. I, I'm the price maker. I can, you know, go right. Okay, who's got most money in the room, and I'll sell you cakes. And the least money, well, you know, try harder. God. Don't worry, it's a meritocratic world. <laughs> go, go and find a, a level playing pitch. Um, so the next, uh, poverty, starvation, and famine as weapons of war. So this, this is, this has been used over millennia, no doubt. Uh, and I'm looking more at recent times in the late 19th century, murdered by British state policy of uh, between 12 and 29 million Indians through instituting a famine. I, I wasn't aware of this. Uh, it was an article pointed out by Susan that George Monbiot had written. And the, the, the British Raj were uh, really quite quite bare faith about uh, creating famine. Uh, Stalin also used famine to reduce population numbers. Um, and, and for those who want to keep a running track, if you go to the, the tab to the left, Susan, please, the FAO.org, the, the tab to the left of the Mobile. Yeah. So you can, and you're freely available, the United Nations reports on food security and nutrition, uh, and they're regularly produced and free to download, and they're profound and clear reading. Um, so... <laughs> In 1877 and 1878, at the, at the height of the famine, grain merchants exported a record, record 6.4 million hundred weight of wheat. So, in response to your question, these are bad decisions. Well, the, 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 no doubt there are plenty of bad decisions, but there are also plenty of decisions prioritizing profit over over people's lives. That is a bad situation. That's more diplomatically than I would. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, it's when decisions aren't thought through as well. So in Europe, when I voted for May, for whatever reason, um, in Europe, they decided to put biofuels in car cars, you know, to try and stop climate change. So you go, what a great decision! Um, Until the price of corn and maize and everything rockets. And then people who are growing stuff can't afford to eat it. Yeah. So it's not, you know, sometimes it's not a bad decision. It's a, it's a, a decision that hasn't really been thought through in terms of other impacts. So you know, in some ways, you go, what a great idea. Yeah, let's stop climate change. Yeah. And then, oh, no, there are all these people dying because they can't afford to eat. Yeah. And then you have to readjust. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, think, I think some really deep problems yeah. how we make decisions because each of us has these amazing things in our heads <laughs> which are really amazing things. Um, but they... When you put a load of them together, they don't work together. Yeah, they work that's, against them. Yes. And we've got to deal with that because otherwise that's going to kill us. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, you know, this is really, you see, I, I don't know if you're going to get onto education in talking about this, but you have to point the finger at education. 
Well, I, I really think a lot of reason. This, this is the financial industrial complex we're really looking at, the effect of this um, sort of tempest that's affecting us all. It's not conscious. You've got uh, CEOs at the heads of multinational companies. They, they are told, do this or you will get the sack. The fiduciary responsibility of the chief executive officer of a company is to return more profit to their shareholders than prior. And uh, that, whilst that's not cast in law, it's very strong in law. And the test case was Henry Ford. Henry Ford was actually saying, oh, all the people who are making these cars should get better wages because they're making the value of the company. And the shareholders went, oh, oh no, 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 anyway. And the test case was uh, uh, the, the Ford, uh, Ford one. <laughs> uh, he, he was defeated in court. And that has set the majority precedent throughout history on the stock market. So in, in, in education, education is now being sized up by finance as a profit-making opportunity. Just as agricultural industry was, well, okay, well, we can't invest in this anymore. It's, it's dried up. We have we chewed all the meat off, off the, the bones. We have we're, we're ramping up the scarcity of production. So we're ramping up production scarcity in education, which is basically to say this group of people can get their degrees and the other group can they can't afford it, so we'll help. Um, we're ramping up scarcity in terms of um, accommodation. Property, Dan Dawlin's actually wrote a wonderful book about uh, the property crisis. Um, and the blurb, I remember, says, you know, if we allow people to hoard food so the price of food goes up and half the population, we wouldn't let that happen. But we've allowed it to happen in property. We've actually we've probably allowed it to happen in food too. I, I think it comes of people sitting in little glass steel offices going, how can I make more money? <laughs> and not standing in communities going, what's of value? For, for me, political economy is uh, it is reflected nicely by the statement, it's the study of the average everyday human in the everyday business of life. Uh, it's, it's the exchanges we have, it's the way we manage our home. Finance has taken it into an abstract world where we just go, uh, well, can, can we make more money from a, a millisecond? Yeah. Well, we'll just say yes. I uh, will make, well, well, that's what Nike do. Uh, per thousand seconds. If you watch uh, The Corporation by Joe Blackman, a uh, professor of law, shows how profit is, is structured. So yes, uh, education is being sized up and uh, it's the same. It, there, there are no more, uh, there, this is all the ethical litmus of the driving forces. If they're letting this number of people suffer and die, the forces will not go, oh, wait a minute, maybe, maybe people might need some free education because it replenishes the culture, the society, it makes us all healthy and happier, uh, etc. Uh, but for tonight, so. but, but that means that, you know, that coming back to the topic of Brexit, you know, the, the whole thing about, um, you know, the immigrants take everything away, that's fabricated then as well. Because nobody goes against the little man in their box in the city, you know, sitting behind his desk. Because, you know, it's not them who did this. It's, you know, it's the Polish guy 
who came over who did this. Mm-hmm. So they, you know, which comes back to education. Because, you know, why do the people in France put on yellow vests and slash bags? Why don't the Germans do that or the, the English do that? Because it, it's them who, who created this. But, but then, you know, why do people, you know, they, they know something is wrong and they go against someone else because they think that's what creates my misery. But they don't go against the right people, mm. although the knowledge of who these people are is, you know, abound. It's, it's you know, everywhere. It is, for me, trying to avoid a knee jerk because pension funds, well, these, are, these are legitimately going to be, this is how people will live and survive and uh, uh, get through. Um, day to day life in, in our culture, but it's how that money is invested. Now, I, how many people have written to their pension fund and gone, um, I'm invested in arms recently. God, just tell me, it's my money. Yeah. Uh, or, or your local bank, you know, have you invested in anything that's, uh, uh, <coughs> Dislocated a population or um, starved anybody? Um, it, these, these, it, it, it's, most, it's not a simple problem. I know, I know, I know. And, yeah. and of course, the, 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 the other going, yes, it's somebody else, it's the outsiders coming in that's creating the, the poverty, is the. Which something? Mm-hmm. Um, I've been blamed on somebody else. Single parents twenty years ago when yeah, I was a single no. parent, it was all our fault. And well, then it was the remains that came in. It was their fault. And then it was the and prior to that, it was the Pakistanis that came when I was a child. It's always for some reason I don't know what it is. There always seems to be this. Let's look at somebody else. It's their fault rather than take the plank out of my own eye. And have some compassion for my fellow man. What am I doing wrong? What can I do to make a change? I'm not going to do that. Let's blame that person. Yeah, I was going to say, as I was ruminating at the point about what was happening in England in the 1840s, and I was thinking, because that's about the time Karl Marx is thinking about the question of the reserve army of labour, the idea that yeah, if you have a lot of immigrants, it drives down the price of labour and it sort of reduces wages. Mm. So, you know, I'm speculating, but I wonder if the way that the British perceived the, or the English perceived the Irish family was simply an immigration problem, mm. because they don't only see people arriving on boats, coming here and taking more jobs like they're nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Speculation. Yeah. <laughs> Same old. <laughs> <laughs> but if you look at the, the enclosures and the Highland clearances and the Lowland clearances, which are, are less known about it, this repeating pattern, right? Okay, sheep are now profitable. You're not. You're not allowed to do what your families have done for generations which is subsistence farm and uh, with small surplus uh, for relationships with people across the glens, you're just off. And so people were driven into the cities, into the mills, in the d- dark satanic mills, uh, because they were suddenly precarious. They could go, you're exploiting me. I'm going to go and eke out a little patch of oats. It was all taken, and then they could be dictated by, of course, these displaced populations. They'd be hunger marched and whatever. Suddenly we'd arrive in an economy, and people would see, we, we were here first, but it was the, the lairds in, in Scotland that were doing They were just going, so a super farm's more profitable than all these communities that are on, well, it's kind of our land now. 
<laughs> um, I've, I've, I've ranted on the island two inches on the wagon. You can just like, like uh, you, you go out to get that different plot. Um, so, can we move on to the next slide? Um, so, the, the Nazi Germany used, prior to the final solution, there was actually a, a, something called the Hunger Plan. Uh, and that was Herbert Bach, who, who was orchestrating this. And I, I gathering together histories throughout time, going, well, if we can look at the past, we can learn more about what the future is capable of. Um, and, um, of course, uh, the, the United Nations came together, was formulated as a response to a lot of these problems. So, uh, well, problems, wars. You know, ever, people came out of the Second World War uh, traumatized, say the least. And so, um, the, the countries of the world got together and said, let's not do this again. And um, so, some information on the United Nations is, uh, in 2009, there were 9,923 uh, international conferences, meetings of experts, and multinational negotiation sessions amongst the member states and the Palais de National uh, of the Europe, European headquarters of many UN agencies in Geneva. 9,923 meetings, conferences in the United Nations. So there's this huge global conversation going on, and not all of this information surfaces, which is why I'm, I'm pleased to now be passing into the UN report. Um, a, a brief history of the formation of the United Nations. At the end of the World War II, two-thirds of the uh, planet's people still lived under the yoke of colonialism. Fifty nations participated in the United Nations Conference on International Organization, uh, and the United Nations Charter was drawn up and signed 26th of June 1945. In order to be admitted to the UN, uh, the, the, the founding conference, the country's government had to have declared war against the Axis prior to 1945. So it was a, a result of the repulsion against the damages, mutual damages that, that, that were incurred. Um, I, I, if, if you're wondering about my pauses, I, I try, uh, built my slides in open office and then converted them into Microsoft Word. And the two don't, <laughs> don't play there. Anyway, um, so connecting corporate ownership with the doorstep. Um, the, the idea that famines are created by human population shocked me uh, when I discussed this, discovered how uh, ingrained pension funds and banks are in general in the unaccountable practices of the stock market. I started asking different questions. Um, and uh, oh, what time are we at? Just to. Right. Well, to give you a sense uh, that the the stock the this doesn't just affect developing countries like the, the African continent they're not allowed to add value to their their produce and ship abroad. There's lots of economic embargoes and. Uh, things interfering with them becoming self-sufficient. Um, 
But these stock market fluctuations actually uh, impoverish the, the people in, for example, the United States. Um, in 2008, it was the world's record wheat harvest. More wheat had been produced than ever in history. And there was a bubble on the price, and it costed more than ever in history. And uh, Frederick Kaufman, a uh, professor, wrote about this bubble and how Wall Street starved millions of people to make that money. Um, the, the worldwide price of food had risen by 80% between 80% between 2005 and 2008. The United Nations was not insulated, uh, the United States was not insulated from this, as 49 million Americans found themselves unable to put a full meal, a meal on the table. Uh, across the country, demand of her food stamps reached an all-time high, and one in five kids came to, uh, to depend on food kitchens. In Los Angeles, nearly a million people went hungry. In Detroit, armed guards stood over grocery stores. Rising prices, news the New York Times, may have played a role. Um, the state of food insecurity in the world, uh, 2008, estimated the number of hungry people at 923 million in 2008, uh, with an expected increase of 40 million. Um, it, so I, I, I hope that gives a, a sense of some of the, the information I've been picking across. And I'm going to sort of draw my ramblings to, to the close and ask some of your thoughts before uh, we can have some questions. <laughs> so thank you for listening. Uh, what, what are your thoughts? Any? There aren't any stockbrokers here. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's important because um, you have to look at real human beings wherever they come from. And so if there was a real stockbroker here, they probably be very wealthy. But they probably have children who they love very much, and those children go to private schools, which are very expensive, and they have to pay fees, and, you know, all the things that parents do for their children because they love us. And they would feel very threatened by the idea that we would be saying, actually, we really shouldn't be doing this thing. Mm -hmm. Existentially threatened. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this is the problem. The, 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 the scarcity goes at all levels. And some of it we make up. So we make up hedge funds and we make up all sorts of, you know, we make up scarcity of food and say food's abundant. Um, but, and we make up scarcity in education, we make up, you know, money, actually, damn it, that's made up too. Um, but then there are certain aspects of scarcity, like land and, um, love. So, you know, your children are scarce and precious. But, but that isn't made up. That's a real thing. And, and I think we, we, we strive to tease this apart. Hmm. <sighs> Yes, yes. I, I, I'm certainly trying to do this and uh, make sense of this crazy world because I really love to sit and just game the system and go, I've made more money. And it is like the, 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 uh, Great Wall Street crash. I was reminded money wasn't lost. It just changed hands. And that's what you're watching in the stock market. It's not a loss. And um, what, what we, if you look at some of the, the, the highly produced foods, if you see fortified wheat flour, that's flour that's had all the goodies taken out so it can sit as effectively dark sawdust because bacteria won't thrive. And before they can sell it, they have to have, rip 
enrich it with to a minimum nutritional value. It's not benevolence that looks and you know cows go, but fruits are next to vitamin A, B, whatever. They're they're told by governments you can't sell this because if people exist on it, they'll develop physical ailments. Um, and talking to stop you know people and and their investment, yes. I will try and do that. Um, I think that's important. I think that's it. Just to kind of add to that, I think you raise a really good point. Uh, and I think w w within the working within education, um, you know, the, there's a kind of I think there's a, an increasing tendency, which is quite worrying, to kind of uh, judge or categorise, explore the ethics of something that is just being left wing. Yes. Yeah, and, yeah. And, where, and rather, what, what it should be about is asking these larger questions about whether we should be doing something. You know, the whole neoliberal onslaught, which has infiltrated everything. Yeah. You know, there should be a space within the university to actually say, I, hang on a minute, should we be doing this? We need to take a step back and, and, and ask these ethical questions, not left-wing questions. You know, these questions about human dignity. Uh, so it is, yeah. <laughs> That's, that's a good point. Somebody asked me, uh, uh did a, a, a short version of this. Uh, so, isn't this like a, a socialist thing that you're doing? I said, I, I just don't recognize the, the language. Mm -hmm. if, if you think about your children or your parents, is that socialism? Mm -hmm. Or is it innate huh? behavior to homo sapiens? You know, we're, we're yeah, yeah. social mammals. Yeah, there's a whole notion of justice. You know, justice is about equality, egalitarianism. It's, it's about making things as equal as possible. Uh, again, that, that's not left-wing socialism. And that's about human dignity. And, and, and when it just seems that it's becoming increasingly difficult to talk about such things without being kind of, uh, without being misappropriated and aligned with some kind of Marxist agenda, you know, kind of, Hi, trying to hijack the new generations with this, uh, uh, you know, sort of communist initiative. It's, no, we're asking questions of ethics and, and, and dignity and justice, and, uh, and and we should be in a position to criticise the stockbrokers and the people, of the, the the captains of industry uh, that, that seem to well, the university is, is kind of increasingly trying to build itself up. Yes, uh, and uh, but wait, which, so it, it's good to ask these questions. The University of California, they've um, tried to embed ethics in a disciplinary way by setting up um, kind of, you know, discussion groups that focus on ethics, mm -hmm. getting different people from different parts of the university together. I don't know whether it's still going. I read about it a few that's years ago, good. but you just think, what a brilliant idea. <laughs> you know, it's like... You know, having talked to, um, I hope there's no nuclear physicists in the room, um, where I actually put to them the question of the ethics of what they were doing, they just looked at me like they had no idea what I was talking about. Yeah. You know, they were actually kind of, why are you asking us that? We're nuclear physicists. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm asking you because you're nuclear physicists, mm -hmm. you know. And it, it made them have to think in a completely yeah. different why, direction. But, but why do they have that? One track intellectual. Why? Why does that whole intellectual mm -hmm. being get focused on that one narrow yeah. range of thought? Mm -hmm. It's the structure of our institutions. It's yeah. the way we live and the funding that comes from outside that funds those well, that, yeah, roles and gives them very it's narrow. Everything from publishing channels to yeah, it's yeah. yeah. Ragged needs to get bigger. As 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 what ragged is, uh, we're developing it as a practical philosophy which in the future people will and rising if you like. There will be an AGM. Everybody will be wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Let me guess working classes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they might just stop first. Stop. <laughs> it's very important to me, particularly coming back from a homeless background, where poverty has featured profoundly in my life, and bureaucracy has not been, been presented as a means of achieving, but as a barrier to achieving. And for me, I will, I, I'm seeking models of education that can thrive beyond finance on forms of wealth that we all own and that cannot be monopolized. So our company, our passions, our, the, the knowledge, the, the discovery in the world, the friendship, these are all priceless and infants if we nurture them. Um, I, and finance is just this fragile, this thing that makes everything fragile. How much money do we have? Well, we can only do this. <laughs> yes. you know, oh, well, we need a building. We, you know, it, ground writing is so destructive. <laughs> it seems you end up just grind, writing the grounds to get the grants with the hope that six months down the line you'll have enough time to do what you'd like to do to make the effect the change you'd like to see in the world. And I just thought, uh, I had a chat, I thought, hey, oh, let's stop a meal. Uh, let's try and do this without money and build it on other forms of wealth. Uh, and, and whereby there's not a verticality, there's not a hierarchy, but here's a, a, a practice that if I'm in the, the, the middle of the capture, I can start talking to people. Can you tell me about your wonderful food and your stories that your grandma told me? Told you. And what, what happens up in those hills? What are these local flowers? You know, there's a curriculum around us and it's non appropriable. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, cease talking and uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you.